This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision making from two Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to episode 264. And Ben, one of our goals this year was to bring kind of back to basics for our audience. This week, I think we're going back to the red meat for the people who do appreciate something a bit more a bit more technical. However, great insights, I would argue, for anyone. We've talked about factors a lot. So this week's guest is Pim Van Fleet. And his mission, he wants to get low vol, low volatility as a factor on the map. And he is so articulate, such a nice guy, makes a pretty compelling case. And then we also dove into other other items in the discussion, really good discussion. So Pim is the head of conservative equities and chief quant strategist at Robico. He holds a PhD and a master's in financial and business economics from Erasmus University in Rotterdam, which is where he joined us from. He's also the author of a popular book on low risk investing called High Returns from Low Risk, A Remarkable Stock Market Paradox. Ben, you got to tell us the story behind this conversation. I mean, listen, it's another story of Pim's, I, I was familiar with Pim's research and it, uh, it, it came up enough times that, uh, that it was time to have him on, on the podcast. He had just come out with a new paper on gold, which we did talk about at the end of this conversation, which was a great paper. Um, but since I'd seen his name so many times before that, it was just, just seemed like, uh, all right, let's, uh, let's see if he'll come on. And as much as it was that gold paper that got me to reach out, um, or, or, or got us to have him on the podcast, it, it's the, his low volatility work or his low risk investing work is, um, that, that's where he spent a ton of his time. He actually told us at the end that the, the gold paper was, uh, kind of their, their attempt to diversify their, let's not do another paper on low risk. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, his, his work on, on low volatility is, is really fascinating. And the way that they've, the way that they've looked at it empirically uh, in historical data. So they've done some kind of like what we had with uh, Scott Cedarberg, where, they, where they, he's really done some sort of archaeological work mm-hmm. on getting pre-sample, out-of-sample data uh, to look at factors in general, including value momentum, but also low risk. So that that part of his work on low risk is fascinating and on other factors as well. Uh, but they've also done some really interesting research where they pull apart, because academic factors are long, short portfolios, but they, they've done a paper where they pull apart factors and look at the long leg and the short leg independently and ask how that affects the, the characteristics of factor portfolios. And that's relevant for investors because most investors are not investing in long, short academic premiums. They're investing typically in long only, long only. portfolios that tilt toward, uh, tilt toward a factor. Anyway, so lots of interesting insights related to, to that. Um, but we also talked about factor investing more generally because he's, he's done a ton of work on that. Um, re- really interesting empirical work with both the, the pre-sample paper that I mentioned on the cross section of returns, but they've also looked at global factor premiums, which is looking at like, um, instead of looking at us stocks and finding the cheapest stocks within the U S and seeing how those perform, they look at the, for, for example, the cheapest country or, 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 or the country that has momentum. And so you can look at premiums from that perspective. That paper's in the Journal of Financial Economics, also very interesting. Uh, and then he's got a couple other papers. So we talked about the gold paper, and we talked about a, a paper that they've done on inflation regime, regimes in the Financial Analyst Journal. And that looks at both asset class premiums, like stocks and bonds, but it also looks at factor premiums through different inflation regimes. Just just fascinating. Um, really nice collection of research. But the, the low volatility stuff is really, really gets you to think. We've had a couple of guests who had, I would say, pretty strong views on low vol. Um, and Pim has polar opposite views to those, but very well informed, which I think uh, it just, to the, to the collection of information that we've presented to people on this podcast, I think this, this episode adds a lot. Good to go? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, in, in, in practice, maybe I'll just mention for Pim's job, he, he his research and, and practice is specialized in low volatility investing, uh, asset pricing, and quantitative finance. Um, he's got a ton of papers, which we discussed today, um, pu- published papers, and some great working papers as well. He's also a guest lecturer 
at um, several universities. So I, again, I think this is a really, a really nice conversation to include in the uh, in the collection of information that we've presented to our listeners on on factor investing, and and this gives us a new whole new perspective on low volatility. Terrific. All right, with that, let's go to our conversation with Kim Van Fleet. Tim Van Vliet, welcome to the Rational Reminder Podcast. Hi, nice to be here. Tim, to start off, what is the low risk effect? Now, the low risk effect is um, a big paradox, as we call it. It is the fact that over the long run, low risk stocks have higher returns than high risk stocks. Mm. And yeah, that's a puzzle which, which haunts me basically my entire career, because the big question is, how can this be? Hmm. Uh, and, and when we're talking about low risk, how is risk being measured? Yeah, that's a good one. The risk can be defined in multiple ways. So the volatility effect is one of the papers I wrote. In that sense, you can sort and define risk on past volatility, but you can also sort uh, and define it as market beta, so that's systematic volatility. Um, if you take a few steps back, then you could say they, th th these definitions of risk give you similar exposure to similar stocks. So they tend to be defensive. And of course, there are differences between the two. But overall, you can define it in different ways, mostly on uh, statistical fluctuations of the stock. How much lower risk is a low risk portfolio? Yeah, in general, it's difficult to get your risk out completely because you're still long in the equity market. But you can get your risk down by about one third. So the beta can go to 0.65. Volatility can be reduced by 20, 25%. Hmm. Crazy. Now, so that there's this anomaly or, or, or premium. How does the, the, the magnitude of the low risk premium compare to other premiums like value or, I don't know, profitability? Yeah, so it's, it's you could say it's the biggest. Um, wow. And uh, it's pretty big, big claim. So let me ex explain this a little bit. Now, first of all, it's not a risk premium. Huh? So in finance, when we find premiums, some people say it's a compensation for risk. Others say it's maybe data mining or uh, it could be behavior. And these are the, basically the three main explanations. So with low volatility, you get the, uh, a higher return than the high full stocks uh, and a bit similar than the market. So the outperformance first to market is just, it's, it's like 1%. So it's not that big. But if you do this uh, beta corrected, so you long low vol, and then you lever up because it's uh, low vol, so you bring it to market risk, and then you short high vol, and then a bit less because it's high risk. So you do this in a beta neutral way, and that's also popularized by uh, the betting against beta paper. That's also where they do this technique. And the beauty is that you then get a, a factor premium where you take this risk out. So it's it's long low vol. Mm. say 1.5 long and it's short 0.5 high vol now, what you then get is a, a premium of about 8% per annum mm. with uh, uh, yeah, a, a pretty low risk so the sharp ratio uh, yeah, is, is one of the highest it's higher than HML it's higher than uh, SMB and the other factors so size, value and mm. quality the momentum is at par, but the problem with the momentum factor is that it's very difficult to implement. Uh, so academics usually ignore implementation, uh, usually ignore transaction costs. That's something yeah, uh, often ignored, I think, for the wrong reasons, because it's very important to translate gross alpha into net alpha. So the, the volatility premium is basically the biggest if you also consider transaction costs and implementation costs, uh, if you take that into account. And then the evidence, uh, I think yeah, 90% of all academic studies on uh, empirical asset pricing focus on US stocks. And of course, it's a big market, but there's also uh, yeah, international stocks, emerging market stocks, and also other markets like corporate bonds. It's also a huge market. So if you then test the low risk effect also on international equity, and we did in uh, our 07 paper in the Journal of Portfolio Management, where we also saw that this premium is very big in uh, Japan and Europe. And then Japan is interesting because in Japan, we know that uh, 
momentum has problems in Japan. So that's the, the exception of uh, the momentum premium. So it fails there. The same in China. In China, momentum is not working that well. Uh, well, the volatility premium is very big there, also in China. Mm. So it's a very consistent international premium. And it also works across sectors. So we know that value uh, has problems uh, as a factor across sectors, whereas uh, volatility does not. So it is the biggest uh, and also one of the most uh, consistent and robust premiums out there. Mm. And on top of that, academics have most trouble getting their head around it because if anything, it cannot be a risk premium mm. because you sort on risk. How pervasive is a low risk effect in asset classes other than stocks? Yeah, so the lower risk effect is pervasive. I, I shortly mentioned uh, the evidence for international equity markets. You also see it uh, to be present in uh, bond markets. So one, one nice way to look at it is a, a look at the term premium. So the, the yield curve of bonds, you already see that the slope is nonlinear. So uh, usually it's upward sloping. At this day, it's even inverse. So there you also see that for each unit of duration, you get a lower compensation. And in fact, you even get a negative compensation nowadays. So that's one, uh, in one view, you see the low risk effect to be present in the government bond market. If you go to corporate bond market, you also see that uh, if you sort on rating, you see that the sharp ratio of uh, triple A's is better than the sharp ratios of triple B's. So also within Corporate bonds you see the same. Uh, of course, rating is just one way to look at risk there. So you can also look at spread volatility uh, to to see which bonds are more risky than others. Uh, so it's also there. Yeah, there is a maturity effect and a low risk effect in corporate bonds. Yeah, then it's it's a bit funny. It's it's like when your wife is pregnant, you see suddenly pregnant women all around. If you bought a red car, you see red cars. It's the same with the low risk effect. Once you see it, you see it everywhere. And um, it's even also, we did quick tests on cryptos. Also on cryptos, you see uh, a low risk effect. Uh, you see it in, in the betting market. So if you go to the horse race, uh, the long shots give you a lower return. Uh, so it's, it's amazing to see, uh, to find an example where it's not working and that low risk, the low risk effect is not there. So there's yeah massive evidence, um, yeah, and that's that's fascinating because it raises many questions. Hmm. Okay, so you, you touched on um, you touched on it, it exists in other asset classes. It, it, it exists. Uh, it's it's geographically persistent. How persistent has it been through time? Yep. So it is uh, from an absolute point of view. You see. That the low risk stocks, if, if we go back to US stocks, you see that if you go back to 18, uh, uh, the 1860s, so that's 150 years, we've created uh, maybe the longest backtest ever. So we extended even the CRISP database. And there we see that in each decade, uh, low risk conservative stocks, as we call them, outperform speculative stocks. Mm. So it is very time consistent so we say never a lost decade so every decade you also beat cash however uh, if you look at the market so the market's <laughs> portfolio there can be periods uh, when uh, even over long stretch periods that the market outperforms low risk stocks that can be a decade stretch uh, still at a higher risk mm. uh, but there you need the leverage components to really see the premium coming back so over time, it's consistent, but sometimes you need either leverage or some patience to really uh, uh, outperform. How does a low risk portfolio perform relative to the market in up and down periods? Yeah, so as a simple rule, you could say if the market is up, you tend to lag. And when the market is down, you tend to outperform. Very simple. If the market would be purely fully efficient, this would always be the case. Now, here's the trick. So the money, what you outperform in a down market is more than what you tend to lack in an uh, uh, up market. And overall, that's where you can outperform the market. But it doesn't feel like outperformance because most of the time markets go up, uh, like on a day or on a monthly basis, it's like 60, 70% up. So that means that the, the feel good 
uh, the, the feeling of our performance is not there. Most of the time you're lagging. On top of that, um, uh, yeah, you also uh, are not happy when you outperform in a down market because you're still losing money. Mm. You see? So it is really emotionally a tough trade to do low volatility investing, mm. especially because what you say, the payoff pattern is asymmetric. People run like a positive school uh, where you can be rich, uh, 10 beggars, you know, lottery ticket kind of payoffs. This is the opposite. So it's like many times you're losing a bit and then when the market goes down, you outperform, but you're still losing. So it's really a only when you look back over five, 10, hey, you look at your wealth you and you look only infrequently, then your well-being shoots up. But if you look at this at a daily basis, then it doesn't feel uh, very good. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, okay. So you, you may have just touch on, uh, touched on the answer to this question, but w w what are the theoretical explanations for the low risk effect? I think there are many. This is one. Um, it, so if you formalize this, what I just said about uh, how emotionally tough it can be, we uh, have benchmarks, which are very useful to see how is a manager doing relative performance. However, it has become a normative starting point for any strategy, which means your performance is driven by relative performance. And that means that tracking error uh, is not good. Now, to give an extreme example, suppose I could give you a stock which goes up every year by 10% for sure. Still, the stock would have a huge tracking error compared to a benchmark because if the S&P is up 30%, we're lagging 20% and you might be unhappy. If the market uh, yeah, goes down uh, minus five, of course, you're happy with the 10. But the interesting thing is that tracking error is something really uh, uh, tough. And in that sense, we have institutionalized this because yeah, like 40 years ago, benchmarks were less important. And nowadays, they, they have become more important. Hmm. In fact, uh, information ratio is the key objective for many uh, strategies. So information ratio is outperformance per unit of tracking error. Now, if you take the low risk anomaly and you say, now there's a little bit of outperformance, now there's a lot of tracking error because of this payoff pattern. That means the information ratio is is uh, is very low. Hmm. It's like close to zero, which means that if you have a multi-factor strategy and you add low volatility, your information ratio tends to go down. So you add lots of risk, relative risk to your strategy. So there's serious limits to arbitrage to this. And that's mm -hmm. one important explanation for why it exists. A second one is we all love, we're drawn to risk. Uh, we live in extremes. So either we put everything in cash and savings or we put everything in one stock. Uh, whereas the middle, mm -hmm. uh, the, the much praised virtue in the middle is often lacking. Mm -hmm. So many investors uh, on the stock markets have different objectives than uh, a high, you know, solid capital growth and uh, uh, capital protection, they want to get rich quick. Yeah. And then it's not wise, not smart, not rational to invest in low-level stocks. It's just, it, it wouldn't make you rich quick. You know for sure you're gonna not, you're not going to hit uh, a 10-bagger if you go in low-level stocks. So from that perspective, it's an anomaly which we tend to understand pretty well. There are many rational explanations for it, which uh, means rational, but if you teach people about it, that it's still there. So many uh, institutional clients uh, we serve, they have tracking error constraints. They know about the low vol anomaly and still they say, uh, it doesn't fit in my tracking error budget. Hmm. So I will only go for value, momentum and quality and I leave low vol on the table. And that's fascinating because if you don't have these benchmark constraints and often retail investors have their an advantage, you can profit more from this anomaly than if you're a, a sophisticated institutional investor. In fact, and that's 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 also a fascinating result, hedge funds, you would expect that hedge funds don't have a benchmark, they have cash. You would expect that they could profit from this anomaly. Huh? They want a good absolute return. And what's a striking finding, uh, we found that hedge funds are betting against the low vol anomaly. So there are long high vol stocks, short low vol stocks, exactly the opposite. Wow. Yeah, that's fascinating and also understandable again. 
because if you're a hedge fund and you say, hey, I, I buy some low beta and I hedge it, which then people could say, yeah, I don't pay 220 for that. Uh, so it is not rational uh, uh, or uh, understandable to do that. Hmm. So many explanations for why it exists. Um, that also makes it going forward, uh, yeah, one of the yeah, the biggest alphas for the future, because as as researchers, as investors, yeah, we look we look at the past. As I said, even going back 150 years, you can also look back at this year. But the future is uncertain, and it could also be, always be that factors have been arbitraged away. Now, for this low low risk factor, and we can also touch on the other factors later. Uh, yeah, it's pretty sure that it's not arbitraged away. In fact, it's more undercrowded nowadays than that it's overcrowded. And the reasons for why it's like that are, as I said, understandable and rational. Hmm. We've had past guests argue that the low risk effect is subsumed by the factors in the often cited Fama French five factor model. I'm sure you have a response to that. Yeah, it's uh, it's a good, so there's factor fights going on. Uh, so. Yeah. We started with one, and then we had three, we, uh, and then we got five. So more and more factors are added. And then the question is, which factor explains which one? Um, I think the most serious uh, critique could be about profitability being related to uh, low volatility. And then uh, it's interesting uh, to respond to that, that if you do a long short analysis, you find that uh, quality or profitability and low volatility are uh, related and explain each other. However, uh, that's done in a long short analysis. So, so basically 90, 95% of all academic papers work with long short uh, investing. Well, in practice, more than 90, 95% of the money is managed long only. Mm. So what we did is we took a look at this crit critique and we said, let's uh, let factors drop their shorts as the paper is called. And what we found is that on the short side, uh, so the high volatility stocks are highly correlated with what they call junk stocks, so unprofitable stocks. So these explain each other. So quality can explain high volatility and the other way around. However, on the long side, so the long leg, which that's where most investors are uh, putting their money, uh, it's it's not the case. So low vol stocks are not necessarily uh, high profitable firms. And there you see that if you combine those factors, they support each other and complement each other. So that's uh, yeah, a big critique, but it's not even a critique to this finding, but also to the fact that most asset pricing studies blindly assume that we can all sh short stocks and even short highly illiquid small stocks. But yeah. in practice, it's really uh, hardly possible for most investors. And that's something, a challenge for the academic uh, yeah, academics to bridge that gap, because this is a serious issue. Because it could mislead investors eh? if you have such a long short paper that is not necessarily translating to a long only space where most investors are. So that's uh, that's that, that would be my response to uh, to this. And finally, it's also about how many factors do you throw in eh? if you uh, say you take Buffett's strategy and you throw twenty factors at it, and then you say I, I can explain it with twenty factors. However, in practice, uh, can you do twenty, and why those twenty? So that's also a critique to uh, if you explain. So one rule should also be about simplicity. The beauty about the low-vol effect is that you don't need accounting data or whatsoever. You just look at observed price changes. So you don't need CompuStat. You don't need uh, accounting standards. Also easy to compare across countries and through time. And that's also uh, something you cannot quantify, but low vol is simpler than uh, uh, other met metrics yeah? like with quality you can have operating or cash uh, profitability can you compare it with chinese quality uh, stocks uh, can you compare quality uh, back in time to the 20s so all all those kind of questions pop up where full volatility this is not the case hmm. you mentioned earlier that adding low risk to a portfolio can reduce its information ratio, which is maybe more of a commentary on the information ratio than it is on low vol. But um, w w does it make sense to to combine low volatility with other factors? Sure. 
it depends on your objective. So if your objective is uh, to have capital growth for your clients um, and also capital protection, so the twin objective uh, put forward by any utility or prospect theory, you can, you, this, this is normative, then it makes fully sense to uh, do a multi-factor approach and have low volatility in the factor mix. Hmm. The information ratio yeah, is a secondary object. It's an in-between object and it's fine. Uh, it works in most cases, however, not for this one, for this particular factor. So you would you could combine low risk with like other traditional factors or, or like value and profitability or quality and all that kind of stuff? Yes, yeah, so in a long only setting, as I said, you see that low vol uh, uh, adds to uh, value. Hmm. They're not the same. Low vol adds to quality and uh, low vol adds to momentum. So you could say these are the, the big four. Combining them uh, yeah, makes, it makes very good sense. Uh, then the question is how much weight should you give to all of them? Um, yeah, a good starting point is to equal weight them. Uh, then you can can say, hey, I want uh, my turnover to be a bit lower, and then you give a bit less weight to momentum. Uh, if you want to go maximum sharp, uh, so you don't do one over n, where you say I've got four factors, but you say I want the highest sharp ratio, then you should lean into low vol a bit more. So then you create a defensive multi-factor uh, strategy. And uh, one of our studies uh, is on the conservative formula, where we basically mix uh, uh, a couple of factors so very simple three and then you get exposure to all the big factors out there which is smb hml uh, or rmw yeah excuse my acronyms for your listeners but uh, the size value momentum uh, quality factors are all captured with one simple uh, strategy so in everything i do we do we believe to use multiple factors and don't go single but you can you you can vary the mix, and you can also vary the complexity and the simplicity. Hmm. I don't I don't think you need to apologize for the acronyms. Our our, our listeners are, are <laughs> fairly well seasoned in the uh, especially those acronyms. Um, I, I I just want to come back to what we talked about what you talked about earlier with the Fama French factors and and the long short stuff. So, just just to reiterate for listeners, it, in a long only setting low risk is distinct from other factors and, and, and add something to a factor portfolio. In a long short setting, um, shorting the junk um, is uh, is sufficient to get something similar to the, to the, to the low volatility effect, but that, that only works in a long short setting. In a long only setting, low risk is a distinct factor. Is that right? It is right uh, to add on the, on the shorts it's pretty yeah, easy is not the right word, but it's easier to detect, to detect uh, a shorting candidate because they tend to be the same. They tend to be high volatile. They tend to be unprofitable. So if you have one characteristic, basically you've got the others as well. Hmm. Uh, and that's, that's the point. So on the short side, um, yeah, if you take high volatility, then usually it's also unprofitable. And then the problem comes in that the, the like, the, the, Short candidates, factors like like losers, eyeful, unprofitable, yeah, they tend to be pretty risky to short. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, because on the short side, it's asymmetric. So if something shoots up 400% and you're short, you, you can lose more than your uh, principal. So that's even trickier. So you can rely less on diversification of factors on the short side, and you should be more careful when you do shorts. Mm. That's also the reason why most investors don't enter the short game. Right. But that's that's a good summary. Yeah. Speaking of most investors, let's assume a listener decides they want to allocate to low risk. What should they consider in evaluating different strategies or products? Yeah, so they can do it three ways. So either uh, if they have their own portfolio, they can screen. So they can take a look at their beta of their uh, individual stock holdings. And then uh, especially watch out for, for the, the, the most cyclical ones. So beat up of 1.5, 1.3, be careful. Uh, but, and then you can already implement alpha of the low risk strategy. And then you can push this further and say, hey, uh, I'm a hardcore believer. So I throw out everything with the beta above one. I fully go defensive. 
So that's that's one way. And then you can add screens on top of that, uh, like value or quality, all kinds of screens you have. I spoke with quite some investors who work with screens and do it yourself. And they usually didn't have the risk screen. Eh? So they had everything. They had like 10, 20, 20 screens, but not risk. That was interesting. That's also why I uh, decided to write a book for the, more the, the, the broad audience to bring low risk as a screening factor more uh, top of mind. Also, some screeners even didn't have a, a risk screen. <laughs> that also, was also information. So, that, so that's one. So do it yourself. You can screen on risk. Two is you can say, hey, let's buy an index, an ETF. Uh, there are pretty good low-vol uh, ETFs out there. So MSCI started very early on, 08, just before the global financial crisis. Uh, but also S&P has, has good ones. So uh, that's two. And then three, you can also go for an uh, actively managed quant fund. Uh, could be ETF or uh, a mutual fund. And what you dare then get is usually a, a blend of factors in a defensive strategy. So you get a multi-factor defensive strategy. So these are three ways to do it. Hmm. I, I want to move on to factor investing more more broadly. We've, we've touched on that. Um, you mentioned your paper looking at the cross-section of returns back to 1866. How did you, how did you assemble the data for that paper? Uh, first of all, it's a, a joint effort. So as, as you might have seen, all my papers are uh, collaboration. And this was with uh, Guido Baltz, a professor in behavioral finance, and uh, Bart von Fleet, same name as me, not, not family related. Uh, he credits to him. He uh, and also other students and interns uh, before him. What we did, we started with global financial data. There you have return, uh, stock returns. So that's doable and you have to really clean this, but you can do that in a sy systematic way. But then the issue is uh, we had to hand collect or Bart and, and the others, the uh, market cap values of the stocks by looking at the shares outstanding. So uh, going through the newspapers uh, one by one, wow. and they don't change <clears throat> every month. So uh, how he did it uh, and uh, the team did it was look at uh, intervals and then see if the number of shares outstanding changed. If it didn't, you would pre uh, know that they were constant. So by having the uh, outstanding shares there, we had uh, two things. So we had market caps, and that's very important when you do asset pricing studies. If you uh, often micro caps distort the results, uh, lots of things going on there and not really representative. So you need market cap. So that's what we hand collected and added to uh, the global financial database. And therefore, we added 60 years of new data in the cross section. To recall, uh, Eugene Fama and French with their big seminal paper, they had uh, about 30 years of data when they found size and value to be factors and Peter not to be working. This has been confirmed uh, out of sample, pre-sample, but it was only 30 years of data. With this 60 years of data, um, yeah, we it opened up whole new opportunities with, as I said, uh, market cap values and also share issuance because we knew the shares are standing and that's also a factor you can then test. Hmm. Which factor premiums did you look at? Yeah, so we looked at the, uh, the common uh, factor premiums for which it's... Uh, for some people, clear that they are positive and significant. However, for others, they're not. So we looked at the main factor premiums, which is value, uh, momentum, low risk, and also uh, uh, size. But for size, we know that there's debate whether it's a, a factor or not, because out of sample and uh, post bonds, uh, the results have been mixed, not very strong. The consensus view is that size is a catalyst factor. So other factors work better uh, for small caps, but standalone, it's not that strong. So um, it's a good way to test. So is there a size effect in this market? We did have market caps. The answer was, um, again, not significant. So small, but not significant. So very much in line with the 20th century. Then uh, momentum, uh, strong one. There was already some evidence. Other papers looked at momentum, but then equal weighted because there was no market cap data. Strong equal weighted, also strong value weighted. Uh, again, transaction costs matter also in the 19th century. 
good to mention is transaction costs were not that high as people think. People think mm. transaction costs were crazy back then. And it's not the, the, our ancestors, we should be a bit proud of them. They were pretty sophisticated and <clears> knew how to uh, yeah, uh, how to deal with uh, yeah, slower pace of information, but still pretty efficient because transaction costs in the 19th century were not much higher than the early 20th century. They only came down really mid 20th century and with the optimization, they went down. So also momentum, uh, like, like now you have trading frictions, but cross it's a strong premium. Uh, value, <clears throat> we found difficulty of <clears throat> excuse me, difficulty of uh, defining that because book to price, there were no standard accounting practices. And that's what I mentioned before about because with quality, it's even more difficult. We couldn't mm -hmm. test quality. For dividend, for value, we took dividend as a proxy, so dividend to price, which is a value factor. It's not perfect, but uh, comes close. And we found a value premium, uh, but weaker than the momentum premium and also weaker than the low vol premium. So low vol, again, was a strong premium, so the risk return relation was flat in that period. Uh, not not much inversion, but flat. So uh, and then if you then take uh, the risk adjusted uh, approach, as I mentioned in the beginning, you see the factor to coming out very strong. And also, uh, yeah, it's a low turnover strategy, and so it's also easy to implement. Uh, so that's the factors we tested, and these were the findings and. I can tell you when we first ran the tests, I was really a bit nervous about the outcomes because what would I do if low risk came out to not be working then? Because that would be that would need uh, that would be a falsification basically. You could still rationalize anything you find, of course, but that was tricky and um, yeah, more important than if low vol is doing good in the past quarter, yes or no? Because that's more of a yeah, short-term market uh, movement, whereas, yeah, 60 years of data, although it is 19th century and it's not the same as today, of course, but it is 60 years of data and it says something about asset pricing. Hmm. It's pretty cool to see the consistency with value momentum, low vol being relatively strong and size being kind of not, not significant. C can you talk a little bit about why you think it's important to run out of sample tests like this? Yeah, it's very important. Like I said, some, for some people, factor premiums are uh, a feature of markets. They're convinced, whereas others are not convinced yet. For example, uh, we know that value had troubles in the US last decade, and you know, low vol is also yeah. uh, lagging a bit in the in the in this strong rally uh, bull market, which, as I said, that's the nature of low vol, of course. So some are not convinced. And then also in academic circles, there's the p-hacking debate uh, and that all the factors come out. Everybody has an incentive to publish uh, t-stats above two. Uh, so yeah, could it be that it's data mining? Even out of sample is not enough because if you do an out of sample, you could say, hey, uh, the factor was there, but it's arbitraged away. So it's, uh -huh. it's, it's not a proof that it didn't exist. Whereas with pre-sample evidence, so going back, uh, it's untouched and it's not influenced by the researchers. Mm. <clears throat> so that's why it's important to take a look at that. And that's why it should be uh, known to everybody, to the researchers, and it should hopefully land in a nice journal. It's still working, uh, a working paper, but we have high hopes, <laughs> but also expectations that it will land and that people are aware of this finding because it's very important in the, the p-hacking debate. So, our stance there is that, yeah, these common factors, which are easy to uh, to compute uh, with just return data, so no degrees of freedom, no complexity, they they are features of markets, uh, and, and uh, they they are therefore not the result of data mining. That's still a, a very 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 small chance, but this chance is pushed down closer to zero because of this new uh, sixty year of uh, evidence. Yeah. What did you learn from your sample about the economic exp explanations for the factor premiums? Yeah, that's that's a bit more difficult uh, uh, because you want to disentangle different explanations. So what we do know that in the 19th century, the, there was hardly any delegated portfolio management. So investors were owners and mm -hmm. uh, apparently that's then not done. What we do know that, that this is not the only factor. 
driving the low risk effect because otherwise we know it's not there. So, and still there's a low risk anomaly. So that's a negative, negative finding. <clears throat> uh, but uh, low risk is caused by other um, uh, effects. One of them is the lottery skew payoff chasing. Uh, risk-seeking mm. investors now these are uh, everywhere uh, they've, they've been in the past they're, they're they come and go usually they lose money but they enter the markets uh, every time so that's one explanation um, the second one could be envy so even if you don't have a benchmark you still want to outperform your rich tycoon neighbor uh, who's also uh, back then you had all those guys smoking cigars uh you know at near post offices uh, you see the pictures mm -hmm. uh pretty actively trading and i'm pretty sure that they were not buying boring the most boring stuff but they were buying like uh back then you had these russian uh, railroad stocks and uh, it was uh, so i think it's a human human yeah how do you say it? baked in that we like risk if it moves quickly we're attracted to it like flies to a uh a light bulb and yeah we know how it ends if you take too much risk it ends in tears and that's basically what what this uh yeah history lesson tells us but basically these these laws of nature laws of human behavior were also back there that also means that if suppose everybody's the benchmark starts to fade away that that doesn't mean that the low risk effect will be gone so that's an uh, implement uh, implication of this uh, deep historical research. Hmm. Yeah, super interesting. Um, you, you've got a paper, and this one did land in a big journal, in the in the Journal of Financial Economics, that looked at uh, global factor premiums from 1800 to 2016. Can, can you talk about the difference between a global factor premium and the cross-sectional premiums that we were just discussing? Yeah, good uh, to make this, that distinction. So when we talk about factor investing, usually we do we mean U.S. stocks, um, but you can apply factor investing in international equity markets. You're still selecting stocks. You couldn't do this in Europe and Japan emerging markets. In this paper, uh, global factor premiums, we did it across markets. So we didn't look at individual securities. We looked at markets indices, being uh, stock market indices. And then comparing, for example, the US stock market with the UK stock market with a German stock market index, and then applying factors to that. So you can then time uh, test time series momentum and cross-sectional momentum. So what we did is we took the big factors uh, which were documented in the, the top, uh, top A journals in the past five years before we started our study. That is then time series momentum, carry, low risk, um, uh, seasonal uh, and value and we tested them across markets and um, by doing that you can then also move outside equities you can also look at international bond markets uh, commodities and, uh, and currencies so that gives you a whole matrix of uh, uh, six factors for markets so then you get 24 uh, factors or alternative risk premia they're called again risk premia i'm a bit uh, that's yeah. not my word because I would call them factor premiums, which is a bit more agnostic. So 24 and then, yeah, going back to 1800. So we uh, basically out history uh, ourselves because with uh, uh, broad markets, you can go even further. Uh, and there we found positive results. So factor premiums seem to be a feature, a market feature. Also interesting that individually, they are not extreme. And usually they are they're basically all below one. Uh, and that's also uh, yeah good good to be aware uh, that it's gross, so you have implementation costs. That means they're not very visible. Uh, mm. So you need to know wh what you're doing. Uh, and then for some investors, this could mean uh, that you can reap profits from these from these cross factor premiums, which are probably a feature of markets. This is such fascinating information. Between these two papers, how confident do you think investors should be that factors are actually a real thing? How confident? Yeah, it's good to always have some doubt. You can be wrong. Uh, predicting markets uh, is, is one of the most difficult things. Mm -hmm. So it's all putting the odds in your favor. Um, I think you can be pretty confident that 
the factors which are pretty easy and not complex, which have a solid economic rationale, that they will probably be around for the next decade. So if you have your whole investment portfolio, so you have your uh, your saving, uh, you, you have insurance, you start investing, then I would certainly uh, allocate some money to uh, these factors. It's the same with the equity. The, the, the biggest one is the equity premium. Mm-hmm. It's also a factor. We understand it. It has a sharp of 0. 0.4, 0. 0.3, and we allocate to it. I have some doubts on this factor, like I have with all other factors, because they can disappear for a decade. And I hardly meet any uh, any investor who doubts the equity premium, which makes me very doubtful, Thank by you. the way. Uh, so S&P 500, it's not like mana from heaven that you will get your 10% per year. Uh, I don't know. But uh, putting that aside, so I, I'm investing in equities, no worries. But it's always good to have some doubt. Uh, and then if you go to the, the all the factors, keep it simple. So if you, if you look at low risk failure momentum, uh, maybe at uh, and then the quality you can be uh, pretty confident that if you take these four in some way uh, you give them a, a positive weight that they will give you uh, uh, a risk adjusted outperformance in the next decade again it's not a 100% certainty but you're putting the odds in your favor and it would be also ignoring this uh, yeah it could be could be a rational decision where you say hey uh, i've got my insurance i've got my savings and i just have some money i want to play with that's it i don't invest i only secure my money and i do speculation in that sense if you it can be rational where you say i ignore it but i think those people hardly exist uh, you always have this middle part where you say hey i want to put money for my 401k or, or my kids uh, college or some, some long-term goals and then I would definitely advise, uh, take, be confident that these factor premiums exist and then think of a way of getting positive exposure to them. And that can be done in, in multiple ways. I, I agree that doubt is important. Some level of doubt is important. But your pre-sample findings in those two papers are pretty incredible. <laughs> right? I mean, the cross-sectional finding and then also the, the global premium finding, I mean how far you went back and the fact that they were so consistent with the, the, um, the time periods after your pre-sample is, 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 is kind of amazing. Yeah. So you can say I'm more confident on multiple factors, the alpha of the, for the next decade, I think the sharp ratio of the alphas of the four factors I mentioned, I'm pretty sure that that will be higher than the, the sharp ratio of one factor, which is the equity market. I, I've got a question on sharp ratio because because you mentioned it a few times. So so you mentioned that uh, low risk is a negatively skewed strategy. Skewness doesn't work well with the sharp ratio. What are your thoughts on using the sharp ratio to evaluate a strategy like low risk that has a negative skew? Yeah, so the sharp ratio has its pros and cons. It's uh, it's at least better than the information ratio, as I said. It's closer to utility. <laughs> Yeah, better is but like to do a Sortino uh, or, you know, uh, get closer to what we call risk, which is losing money and uh, mm. the depth of loss. However, for practical reasons, I'm not that uh, worried about skewness, that it's inappropriate. So I did my PhD on downside risk. Uh, and yeah, the conclusion is to predict downside risk. Past volatility is pretty good. To describe mm. risk. It's better to move to more, uh, yeah, what risk actually is, which is losing your money, chance of losing, uh, and the uh, amount of money you're losing. So the lower partial moments, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I saw your, your, you have a couple of papers on um, on downside risk, and I, I didn't work them into these questions, but I'm glad it I'm glad it came up in uh, in some way. Uh, you, you mentioned your paper on when factors drop their shorts earlier. So when we talk about factor premiums, we're typically talking about long short portfolios. Why you, you obviously did that paper. Why do you think it's important to examine the long and the short legs separately? Yeah, it's important because they are different empirically. So if the, if, it, if things would be symmetric uh, factors, then it, it would be nice, but we found that you can reach, come to wrong conclusions even on uh, things like quality being uh, spanning low volatility or the other way around, uh, especially given that most money is managed in a long-only setting. That's what you observe. 
So that's why it's very important that uh, academics bridge this gap between uh, yeah, theory and practice. So we uh, published this in the Financial Analyst Journal, which is the journal uh, who has the same aim of uh, yeah, bridging the gap between academics and, uh, and practitioners. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty cool finding. Um, when I saw the first <laughs> results, I discussed them uh, with David, my, my co-author. I was like, wow, yeah, really like, wow, uh, uh, jaw, jaw dropping uh, for a quant. Eh? So sometimes I tell my wife, I found a high R squared and then she's like, <laughs> what's wrong with you? <laughs> well, I was really happy with my high R squared. So that's also <laughs> happened with this. I, I was like, wow, uh, this is amazing. And then, we, yeah, but then we decide to uh, to do something with it because it's relevant for investors and also some of our clients who are long only investors, and they need to know this. Yeah. Does the long leg or the short leg tend to offer better risk adjusted returns? Yeah. So on a standalone basis, uh, you see single factors. Some single factors do better on the short, like momentum. It's really great on the short. But then when you start to combine factors, then the shorts uh, don't add much to each other. And then on the long, diversification starts to pay off. The, and this is before implementation, uh, because in the, on the short, uh, you have higher implementation costs and even also risks, reputation mm -hmm. risk, shorting risks, short squeezing risk, all those kind of things. So if you take all that combined, you could say also to all the listeners that if you're in factor investing, long only multiple factors are pretty good, well diversified. There is something to gain, of course, on the short side. It is not that it's much higher and much bigger out there for factors. So for other short strategies, so also some people say, okay, so shorting doesn't matter for individual stocks. We say no, <clears throat> it could add value, shorting individual stocks, but not if you combine like quality, momentum and uh, and, and risk. So it's a bit nuanced. People sometimes don't like nuance. But for factor investing, it's pretty clear that on the long side, also in taking implementation issues into account, you're doing better on the long side with diversifying factors than on the short side. That's pretty fascinating and a bit counterintuitive. So, so on the long side, factors are less correlated with each other. And on the short side, they're more correlated? Is that? Yes. Hmm. That's what we find. What, what are the practical implications of those findings the practical implementation is that um, if you're not shorting them uh, there's less sort of uh, urge or uh, you know to, that you're leaving alpha on the table mm. so that's one implementation yeah, implication um, another one could be that you say hey let's do long factors short indices uh, then you basically get pretty easy absolute returns without the hassle of uh, short squeezes, reputational risks, uh, uh, and implementation costs. So these are just to name two uh, of the implement, uh, implications of our mm -hmm. findings. Yeah. What concerns would you have with the Fama French five-factor model? A couple of them. So we wrote about uh, a paper we had five, um, but let, let's just talk about it, uh, what, what pops up. Now, one of them is that farmer friends don't include the low vol factor in their five. So they have five and low vol is missing. In fact, they kept one factor in, which is the market factor. Uh, so they stick to uh, a factor being rewards for risk. Uh, that's the Chicago paradigm. Anything with a return should have a risk. So they don't include low vol, low beta as a factor. So that's one problem. Um, another one is that they, uh, yeah, they keep size in. Uh, it's a good explanatory factor, but it's not uh, giving a, a premium, as we discussed. Momentum is clearly not lacking, uh, clearly not in. It's lacking. So the momentum factor is one of the biggest ones. So together with low vol, so low vol and momentum, I would say, with value are the big three in that order: low vol, momentum, uh, value. And yeah, in their five factors, uh, two of them are, are lacking, uh, which is low vol and momentum. So in that sense, uh, and still you have five, uh, which is adding complexity. Uh, so it's a bit complex and not fully descriptive. Uh, so that's yeah, some of the issues uh, yeah, I have. The other one is that it's 
long short in which uh, the way it's constructed uh, it works pretty well so they do the the median size uh, and then they do valuated the problem is that if you're a small company but then within the smaller stocks you're a big one you have a big weight on on the factory returns and if you just switch sides you become a large cap stock but very very small you basically have zero weight in the factor definitions so that is a flip-flopping thing most people don't know. It's also on a 60-year basis, not a big problem. However, if you zoom in, uh, it is sort of problematic. This this is pretty random. So this can be done uh, better in a better way. But that's a bit nitty-gritty maybe, but still could, could distort results. Most important is it's five and two of the top three are lacking. That's low vol and momentum. Hmm. How, how would you put low vol into an asset pricing model like like uh, how would it fit into a, another version of the from a french model Oof, yeah if you try to do that then um basically lots of things collapse for example if you start modeling from a relative utility framework where you see where you say the representative agent as you have in the CAPM, is not uh, concerned about mean variance but about access return and tracking error then uh, that's fine but then equilibrium doesn't exist because the equity premium uh, uh, goes away and your model breaks down. So it's not general equilibrium. It's it's pretty tough. If you say, hey, let's assume, let's forget about the benchmark. Let's say people are gamblers. Uh, then you also have a problem. Uh, so I had one paper on that where we said people are gambling for gains. Uh, so that's not even fully risk-seeking, but, but partially risk-seeking, which means they really love a positive school uh, and then start modeling. Then the problem is that the market is very inefficient because if you like a, a good school, uh, you you shouldn't diversify mm. because you throw away your upside at a must much faster rate than you reduce your losses and your downside. So somebody who likes a positive school doesn't diversify, and that's also what you observe. Uh, people who like a good school they don't buy a thousand stocks; they buy like three or five. Or, that's rational. However, uh, to reach to an equilibrium model and have a CAPM or any Schooners CAPM or you know any relative utility CAPM, you need uh, to have the outcome that the market is uh, efficient. And for those examples I mentioned, it's not. So that's uh, this is basically the whole problem of behavioral finance, uh, which is really good uh, explaining individual behavior, but it's very difficult to bring this to macro and uh, market level. That's basically the struggle our whole finance uh, uh, research is uh, struggling with. Uh, hmm. So maybe may a maybe a good reason that they didn't try and put it in the model because it would have blown up uh, finance altogether. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can put it in. So uh, from an APT point of view, so the, uh, that's agnostic from utility, you can uh, throw in a, a full factor. Uh, you can also create because then you do a long short and, and then you throw it at the right side. That, that, mm. that, but that's more statistical and uh, uh, very light assumptions. And uh, Cochrane calls this the, fact, the factor fishing license. Anything goes, just throw in long short. But then you're then you're really far away from what we call economics uh, and first principles. Um, so what that's what we did as well. So uh, in the paper conservative formula, we create a conservative minus speculative uh, factor, long short, and it blows away many of uh, many factors in a very elegant and simple way. And then we say, yeah, uh, by st sticking to a couple of rules, so you don't have uh, the problems I mentioned with Pharma French Five. You only stick to thousand large caps. It's pretty simple and clear. And then, uh, yeah, you, you, you can uh, get access to all those multiple factor premiums and you can explain others as well. Bl blows away in terms of explanatory power. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, super interesting. All right, we're going to move on a little bit from factor investing to a paper that you did on inflation regimes in the Financial Analyst, financial analyst Journal. Um, so you, you did this another really incredible historical data uh, expedition, I would call it, um, for asset class and factor premiums through inflation regimes historically. How did you define inflation regimes in that paper? Yeah, so we, de we defined it as buckets. So uh, we took uh, 12, 12 months rolling, and then we looked at CPI uh, above four, two to four, 
uh, and uh, also um, deflation. Sometimes we forget, but that can also be uh, a future scenario. So very data-driven, just observing it and then putting it in those four buckets. And how do asset class premiums vary through different inflation regimes? Basically, what's really bad for uh, uh, investors is high inflation. If you go to 4%, above 4, uh, hardly anywhere too high. Uh, stocks do offer some protection, but bonds are really bad. So any yeah, 60, 40 investor who had a great three decades in the US will really suffer. Uh, so that's that's a bad one if you then add stagflation to it. So that means bad economic conditions, it gets even worse. So that's uh, a scenario investors should be fearful for. Hmm. How do factor premiums vary through inflation regimes? They hold up pretty well. So um, uh, so we find factor premiums to be persuasive, so very robust, uh, whether it's deflation or inflation, factor premiums are there. We do see some variation. It seems that like momentum and the risk tend to be a bit better in high inflation, but we do strict statistical tests, so uh, it's at the edge. Mm. Um, What's good is that the size of those premiums is also very stable, which means that if equity returns are really low on bonds and equities, you do get this 3% premium, for example, which is in a low uh, return environment. 3% is more than when equities go up by, uh, by 20%. So relatively, uh, factor premiums become more important and a source of uh, capital growth. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And what economic environment did you find to be the worst for investors? Now, the worst would be high inflation with uh, yeah, uh, bad economic growth. So we looked at several measures for that. Uh, so, for example, recession uh, or uh, other uh, measures of economic activity. And yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's bad. So it, uh, especially if you adjust for inflation, that's also finding. So nominally, it doesn't look that bad, but in real uh, numbers, it's, it's really mm. bad. And that's giving some cushion because also the last year, 2022, we had inflation going towards 10, uh, markets going down almost 20. So, but still, most investors felt minus 20 and not minus 30. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, uh, our behavioral biases help us a bit <laughs> feel less of the pain in that bad scenario. But, however, the truth is, yeah, your your, your wealth uh, evaporates, uh, your uh, purchasing power of that in this stagflationary regime. And you should uh, yeah, be aware of that, that that could happen and also uh, try to take measures to uh, limit those losses. And the factor premiums are still consistent in those brutal periods? Yes, they're very consistent also in, in those uh, periods. So this cannot be an explanation. So also from a rational point of view, you cannot say, okay, so this is the rational explanation why it's there because the premiums are found in all economic scenarios. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really really interesting. That that, that was a cool paper. Um, you, you got another another recent paper that I also liked on on gold. Can you talk about how an allocation to gold holds up as a downside hedge in the nineteen seventy five to twenty twenty two sample? Yeah, maybe some explanation on the gold paper. Uh, so it was sort of a uh, idea that gold comes. Uh, you have the gold haters, the gold lovers. We've, it's it's the crypto of the you know the <clears throat> ancients. Yep. It's a store of wealth, blah, blah, blah. So there's something with gold. Uh, it's also enough for a collaboratory. And I did lots of low-vol papers, uh, I think more than a dozen. So I, uh, we, we thought, let's do let's take a look at gold because gold also is uh, seen as a safe haven like low-vol. So that's sort mm. of the, the reason we looked at it. Also, reactions to the paper, some gold bugs said, Pim, uh, don't you like gold? And gold haters said, Pim, why are you promoting gold? So I got the same paper, uh, completely <laughs> different reactions, <laughs> which means uh, we found a middle way, I think, mm -hmm. if that's uh, the critique. Um, yeah, so yes, so we looked at the safe haven hypothesis of gold uh, in, in this paper. What are the downsides of getting downside protection from gold? Yeah, so it offers uh, some downside protection, not fully. Uh, it offers protection with a longer horizon. So that's the first thing we found. So on a monthly basis, it doesn't offer it doesn't offer much protection to start with. You only start seeing it when you when you move to a, a one year or longer. 
and the downside is you give up return. So it's, uh, uh, yeah, you get protection, but it costs you money. Hmm. And I guess since you looked at Loval in the paper, or is is the, is the suggestion that Loval is a better downside risk protector than gold? Yeah, in this period. So it's for, uh, for for me, it was a short period. So we only started in 1975, which is like uh, how many cycles are we talking about then? Uh, but still, and then for that period, we found evidence that low vol was indeed much more effective. So if you want to protect your your capital, uh, gold is a way to do it. But uh, it's more of a second order effect because if you do it, do it carefully. Don't don't overdo like five percent. You know, it's like putting it's like salt uh, on the food. Don't don't overdo it. So a bit of gold, but with low vol you can go all in. Basically, you can say, okay, let's just take my uh, equities out and, and and put defensive in. If you really, uh, yeah, if if you really don't want to lose money uh, on a one year horizon, then going defensive equities low vol is much uh, is more effective. The good thing is uh, they strengthen each other. Yeah? So it's not either or. Uh, so it's a different source of protection. So in years when Lovell offers protection, it's not necessarily that then gold is also offering it. So they, they uh, correlate positively. You mentioned the sample size. Do you think this sample is sufficient to inform expectations? And maybe to expand on that question, do you actually actually think a 5% allocation to gold makes sense or only in this sample? Oof. Um, <laughs> in a sample for sure. <laughs> Now, going forward, it's very ambiguous. Uh, I, I do I do tend to like the story that w when you go back to Rome 2,000 years ago, you were in the army and you had your monthly wage. You you, you had this golden coin. You go, could go to a shop and buy yourself a toga, you know, a nice uh, suit. You throw it in the sand in the Colosseum. Uh, you put some sand on top of it. Fast forward 2,000 years. You pick it up. It's still clean. It's not uh, gone. You don't have a password which you lost with your like with your crypto or you know your stock account. You go out to the shop, uh, a modern shop, and you buy yourself a modern suit because it's worth a couple of it's like four hundred dollars. This coin. So in that sense, it's an ultra inflation edge. However, as a quant, uh, yeah, the observations are too short. It's difficult to say something about that statistically. So also whether it should be five, one, or ten, uh, it's very difficult to say. Um, personally, I do have a little bit of golden coins, but more as a, I like it as a hobby. I like to uh, look at them and touch them and discuss them with my uh, kids. So, yeah. So you collect a, a, an emotional dividend from your gold. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Our final question for you, Pim. Um, you've obviously done some incredible research. You've also written a very accessible book on low-risk investing. How do you define success in your life? I think success is um, achieving your goals. Uh, for me, my goal is to have a long-term positive impact through family and uh, and finance, if I call it so. Two Fs. So let's start with finance. Um, yeah, I think I believe wealth can be uh, uh, enhancing your well-being. For example, it gives you more freedom. Uh, well-being can also increase if you give to charity. Something, yeah, my wife and I like to do. And we enjoy it. Um, yeah, one of my passions is uh, applying academic investment research and then applying it in a simple way, not, not too complexity. And we yeah, have one insight close to me is the fact that conservative stocks beat speculative stocks in the long run. Um, and I like to read a lot and do a lot of research. And success for me is also to bring this wealth of knowledge on, uh, found in the literature to a broad audience. Uh, for example, Low vol or defensive investing is now one of the common four factors in the industry, whereas about 15 years ago, it wasn't clearly not. Um, and as a fund manager, uh, I'm also uh, managing funds based on all those scientific insights and quantitative factors. Financial success is to deliver a high risk adjusted return to our clients and then significantly statistically. So that's really financial success. I think the, the second one is the F of family. Uh, that's most important, um, being faithful to them. I've got three boys and uh, they will probably outlive me. And uh, yeah, they're great kids. Uh, success for me is to be a good father, a uh, good husband, uh, and a good brother and son. 
besides this, even broader, I think it's important to be a good citizen um, and pos uh, provide positive uh, to society. The golden ethical rule, I like. It's simple. Treat others as you want to be treated. Simple, not easy, I can say. Uh, for me, Christianity is a secure base, a uh, treasure of hope. And wealth can be a blessing, but it's ultimately that you remain faithful to the people around you. If you can do that, I think those two things, you're very successful. What a great answer. This mm -hmm. has been a great conversation, Pim. Thanks so much for, uh, for coming on. It was my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, Pim.